Okay, we are recording. We have a little bit more than a minute left. I'll just do some announcements. The ones I've been saying um, since we haven't officially started yet because it's not eight. So just a reminder, we do not meet in lab today. Um, you should use this time to fix one of your old labs um, and then send me an email um, and let me know which which lab you want me to uh, regrade, if at all. Um, but as far as your grade for this week's lab goes, you don't necessarily need to do anything. I'm going to look at all your old lab grades and choose the highest lab grade and duplicate it, right? So if you had a, if you scored perfectly on a previous lab, then you'll have a perfect 20 score for uh, for this week. Does anybody have any questions? All right, let me uh, share my screen. I don't want to do this the right way here. So again, to remind you, I'm working from home one last time, um, partially because of the illnesses, but also um, with the weather, it caused some really bad traffic. So I, luckily I got news of that early and uh, here we are. But Friday, we will definitely meet in person um, because that's when we'll do the student evaluation. So even if something happens to me, God forbid, like I get in a car accident or my house explodes or I get sick again, whatever the case may be, even if I'm teaching from school from home, which shouldn't be, but even if that happens, I uh, still need you, need you guys to come in so you can do those uh, student evaluations. So even if I'm teaching from home, it would be, which again, it's like a 5% chance that would happen. I need you guys to come in. And I guess that's it. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Let's get started here. Oh, yeah. While I'm pulling this up, too, I'll remind you guys the, the final exam is Monday at 8. So if you're coming in to do it, you're going to need to bring in your computers as usual. Um, if you want to take it later in the week or even later on in that day, you need to contact me this week so we can make arrangements and schedule a time for us to meet online so you can take the exam at a later date or later time um, and have more time to take it. So anyway, if there are no questions, let's get started. And the first word for attendance will be humans. So if you're online right now, send me those words within five minutes after the lecture. Um, I know a couple of you yesterday and well, throughout the semester periodically, some of you are online, but then don't send in the, the attendance words so you don't get the points. So make sure you send those points in. And if you're watching this video at a later date, instead of sending me uh, the word human, find a picture of a human and send it to me. Um, anyway, here we go. Let's move forward. We already talked about this. We were talking about energetics. And the biggest thing you needed to know, let me back up to something we've already seen. Um, the biggest thing you need to know is this, right? For every step, every time we move up one step, right, that you're going to lose 90% of your energy. Or another way of saying that, only 10 about 10% makes it from one step to the next, right? So you lose 90% there, lose 90% there. If there was a quaternary consumer and we did another step, yes, once again, you would lose 90% of the energy. So anyway, that's what we learned about in general. Um, that's how ecosystems work. Um, and then what we left off was talking about the fact that this information that, we, that you just learned can also be uh, applied to humans. So we're kind of looking at the same thing, but from the from the aspect of uh, of humans, which is why if anyone, you know, if you've ever heard why people say, oh, why is eating meat so bad for the environment? What does that matter? And this basically shows you why. I mean, yeah, you'll, you'll also hear about the fact that uh, cattle put off, you know, they basically, they, they fart methane. And yes, that is a greenhouse gas. And yes, that is bad for climate change. But it's not just that, right? <clears throat> basically, uh, long story short is, it just takes more land to feed um, meat eaters, like like myself, I eat meat, you know, I do try to keep it down for well, this for one reason and health for other reasons. But uh, yeah, it just takes a lot more land to feed meat eaters than it does vegetarians, right? So this whatever how big this land is, any given land, you can see if we're dealing with vegetarians, you know, we're looking at what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people versus one person. So, yeah, it's just common sense. Um, of course, you can do what you want to do. I'm not here trying to, you know, for those of you who've had my one awake class, you know, 
it's not my job to tell you this is good and this is bad. This is what you should do. and This is what you shouldn't do. You make your own decisions, your own informed decisions. Uh, but now you know a little bit more about energetics when it comes to humans. So are there any questions about the side? It's pretty simple. All right. So we are now done then talking about energy flow and ecosystems, right? We're done with that. Now we're going to move on to chemical cycling and ecosystems. So I'll remind you of something we talked about in this first bullet point in the introduction um, to help you remember the big picture. So when we're talking about ecosystem ecology, um, remember we, we talk about how energy flows through and ultimately out of an ecosystem, right? Um, usually in the form of heat. And then we said that it's matter that's recycled, right? The chemicals, the, the molecules, those are the things that get recycled. So we're done talking about the energy and now we're moving on to that second portion, which is chemical cycling and ecosystems. So why is this important? Well, it's because life depends on the recycling of chemicals, right? So when you're alive, when any organism is alive, their chemical stock changes continuously, right? As you eat things and drink things and, you know, poop things out and pee things out and maybe bleed occasionally, uh, sweat, whatever it is, right? You've got things coming in and you've got things leaving. Um, so that is recycling of chemicals. Um, so the atoms in an organism at death are then returned to the environment by decomposers, which we le learned about earlier, uh, which replenishes the inorganic nutrients that the producers will use to build the new organic matter. So, right, basically this is all stuff you know. Again, the first bullet point is just saying, hey, don't forget, you know, we've got stuff coming in and out of our bodies while we're alive. And then um, at the end, when we die, all that stuff eventually will be returned back to uh back to the earth and it'll get recycled again so are there any questions about this slide all right here's a good picture from your old textbook as an example right so this tree this horizontal tree right here was alive at one point and upright and while it was alive right it was exchanging chemicals it was exchanging molecules it was exchanging matter right it was taking carbon dioxide in for photosynthesis and putting oxygen out from photosynthesis. It was taking water in from its roots and it was taking nutrients in from its roots, right? And it's all that stuff, right? Just exchanging stuff. And then finally it died and it fell over. And you can see here, this other tree is now growing on it because there are things that are decomposing this dead tree, right? We've got uh, fungus and bacteria and things like that that are decomposing it so that this alive tree can absorb those nutrients, right? And again, the, cycles conti the cycle continues. So what you're going to learn in this chemical cycling is you're, well, basically you're going to need to know three different types. So you need to know the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. Um, both of these two um, basically add up to nutrient pollution, as you learned in one of the videos that you watched in lab. But anyway, yes, yeah, so you're going to learn about these three. You're going to need to know the three, the differences between the three, and I'll tell you when what they are when we get there. But before we learn about the three specific um, cycles, we're going to look at chemical cycles in general. And I'm going to go through this quickly because there's definitely not going to be any questions about chemical cycling in general, right? They're going to be specific about carbon, phosphorus, or nitrogen. But chemical cycles involve a biotic and abiotic factors, right? Uh, biotic and abiotic components, and they are called biogeochemical cycles. So I'm not going to ask you what a biogeochemical the definition of a biogeochemical cycle. But again, you're going to need to know the difference between the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. And both of those, or all three of those, when we talk about them, you, we're going to talk about their biotic reservoir. So like carbon, where is carbon stored in living things? That's what it means by biotic reservoir. Or the abiotic reservoir. So again, using carbon as, as, as an example, where is carbon stored in non-living things right so abiotic is living or biotic is living things abiotic is non-living things does anybody have any questions about that okay um the next word for attendance a box it i'm not even going to say it so if you're watch, if you're listening to this with your eyes closed and you're relaxing i'm sorry i'm gonna have to ask you to open your eyes for a second this is the next word for attendance Again, if you're here live right now, make sure you send these words within five minutes of the lecture being over so you can get your points. And if you're watching the video at a later time or date, <clears throat> send a picture 
of that word, right? Look up a picture and send that word instead of sending the word itself. So any questions about the, the difference between biotic and abiotic reservoirs? All right, so here's the general scheme. You definitely don't need to study this because I'm going to show you the specific schemes for carbon and then nitrogen and phosphorus, right? So this is just in general how <clears throat> chemicals or matter are recycled. So again, like I said, there's an abiotic reservoir, which is the non-living, and then there's the biotic reservoir. So the way it works, whatever we're talking about, again, this is just in general, we have this abiotic reservoir of whatever um, element we're talking about. And then something happens, right? There's, and we're going to talk about what happens. It's specific to the, to, um, the cycle that we're talking about, but something happens that allows this stuff from the abiotic reservoir to go into the producers, right? At which point, once it's into the producers, you know, from here up, that is the biotic reservoir, right? Uh, up here, up is the biotic reservoir, right? So it's in the nutrients, or excuse me, it's, it's in the nutrients that are in the producers. And then those things, you know, the consumers eat the producers and the consumers die and they get decomposed and the producers die and they get decomposed, right? So all these different ways, basically, that we have stuff cycling within the biotic reservoir. And then ultimately, you know, they leave the biotic reservoir and go to the abiotic reservoir. So again, when you're studying this, there's no need to study this picture. This is just the general schematic. What you're going to need to know is the specific schematics for carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. So are there any questions about this picture? And again, just to remind you, this particular picture um, is not in your textbook. So here we go. The ones we need to talk about, carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. So let's jump into it. The first one we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. So again, the big you're going to need to know the difference between carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen cycles. Um, and one of the biggest things I'm going to ask you about is the difference between their biotic and abiotic reservoir. Mostly, I'm going to focus on their abiotic reservoir. So you already know a lot about um, the carbon cycle and the abiotic reservoir and the biotic reservoir because of what we've already learned when you learned about photosynthesis and respiration, right? So the way carbon comes in and out of the biotic, um, the, the living reservoir, right, the biotic reservoir is through photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis takes that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which is the abiotic reservoir, right? The atmosphere is the abiotic reservoir for carbon. And it comes, it's absorbed through photosynthesis. And then once it's absorbed in photosynthesis, as we know, it turns into glucose and other um molecules. So at that point, the carbon is in the biotic cycle, right? And then whether the this plant goes through re respiration or something eats that plant and then it goes through respiration, whichever the case may be, eventually these chemicals, right? This glucose that the plant made is going to get broken down in cellular respiration. And as we know in cellular respiration, that's going to release carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide will then be back into the abiotic reservoir of the atmosphere. So that stuff you already know. I'm not going to take questions yet because, again, <clears throat> this is what you've already learned way back in the beginning of the semester when you learned about photosynthesis and respiration. But now we're just looking at it from a different um, perspective. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video that shows uh, like a little animation about the carbon cycle. But here's a picture. This is, again, not from your textbook. This is from your old textbook. But you don't need to memorize this. But it's just, and it's again stuff you already know, right? We know what you do need to know for the exam is this right here: the major abiotic reservoir for carbon dioxide is the atmosphere, right? There's also other stuff, right? There's still some carbon, you know, in the soil, right? And this plant litter, all this stuff. So there is other uh, fossil fuels, right? Uh, wood. These are also other abiotic reservoirs of carbon. But this is the main one right here. So for the exam, just focus on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? That is the main um, abiotic reservoir for carbon. And that's mostly what you need to know for the carbon cycle. So are there any questions about the carbon cycle? All right, let's move forward and talk about the phosphorus cycle. So, like we, like I just said, the major abiotic reservoir for carbon is the atmosphere. 
The phosphorus is different. Phosphorus does not have an atmospheric component. So what is the main abiotic reservoir for phosphorus? And the answer is rocks, right? Rocks is where most of the um, non, or most of the <clears throat> phosphorus is stored in non-living things, right? Rocks. Phosphates move from land to water faster than they are replaced, right? So again, it's stored in the land, but it gets eroded by rain and things like that, and it washes away eventually out to the ocean. And that process of erosion is quicker than the process of that phosphorus actually being incorporated into the rock. Um, in addition to that, soil characteristics may also decrease the amount of phosphate available to plants. Uh, we don't have time to get into it. You're not going to be tested on it. And I don't even think your book even talks about it. But things like the pH level of the soil might mean, yeah, there's phosphate in the soil, but the plants can't get to it because of the pH, right? This it's just something out there. Um, speaking of which, I'm not going to test you on any of this here. This is just so you know. This is why this is important. But anyway, because phosphate um, is stripped away quicker than it's replaced, and because sometimes it's not even available when it's there, um, phosphate is a limiting factor in many terrestrial ecosystems. And we already talked about a limiting factor before. I said you need to know what it is, right? It's like that one thing that's preventing an organism from growing is not a 100% accurate way to, to describe it, but it would work for this conversation and for this course. And I think last time we talked about it, I used the example of um, like, if you had a factory that made cookies, right. And uh, you know, you have truckloads of butter that comes in every day and a truckload of flour that comes in every day and a truckload of sugar that comes in every day, right. A truckload of everything that comes in every day, except M&Ms, or not M&Ms, uh, chocolate chips, right? You get one bag of chocolate chips a day, despite the fact that you're getting, you know, truckfuls of all the other ingredients, right? So in that case, it is the chocolate chips would be the limiting factor in, in, that, uh, in that scenario. So anyway, phosphate is a limiting factor in many terrestrial ecosystems for all these reasons listed above. And that's why when you use fertilizer, a lot of it has phosphate in it. It also has another thing in it, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So again, I'm going to move forward and I'm not going to ask any questions or take any questions yet on the phosphorus cycle because this slide is just general information that I'm not going to ask you about on the exam. I think there might be a couple of questions about that on the uh, chapter 20 study guide. Here we go. Here's a visualization of what we're talking about. So again, what you need to know for the exam, <clears throat> well, I guess I should do that part right there. The major abiotic reservoir for phosphates is rock, right? And like I said, it gets weathered, it gets eroded because of water, it gets washed away, then it comes into, well, in this case, it's coming to a little, looks like a little pond, right? Went down a stream into a pond. So now we have phosphates in this water. Eventually, they'll clump down and go to the bottom of this lake, and it takes a really long time, but eventually that, you know, this mud and stuff will eventually turn into rock, and then that cycle continues. But that's the abiotic cycle. Again, sometimes it has, or... Yeah, sometimes it will come into the abiotic or the, the biotic reservoir. In this case, what happens is there's, again, phosphates in the soil, which are needed, and then plants take them up, right? Plants, like I said, that's often a limiting factor for the plants. So the plants take them up, so now there's phosphate in these plants. Uh, the animals eat them, so now the phosphates are in the animals. Uh, the animals poop, the animals die, right? The plants die. All this stuff gets decomposed. Um, and then the phosphates are then returned back to the soil where they can be used again, right? So that's the biotic reservoir on the right, the abiotic reservoir on the left. And for the exam, what you need to focus on is that right there. Phosphates, or the rock is the major abiotic reservoir in ph for phosphates. Are there any questions about that? All right. Um, the next word for attendance will be rabbit so it, again if you're online right now make sure you send those words within five minutes of us being done um and if you're watching this video send me a picture of a rabbit not this picture but a different picture of your choosing now finally the last one which is the nitrogen cycle uh the nitrogen cycle actually has two major abiotic reservoirs and you need to know them both and really, if you just memorize the fact that 
this is the only one where I've said you need to know too. That that in itself should help you remember it's nitrogen, right? Because carbon, yes, there's other abiotic reservoirs, but we only talked about the carbon or the uh, atmospheric reservoir. For phosphorus, the major one we talked about was it being in rocks. And now for nitrogen, I'm telling you it's in the atmosphere and it's in the soil. It's in the atmosphere so much, as a matter of fact, that about 80% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, N2. Um, so when you breathe in, you're mostly bringing, breathing in nitrogen, right? You're breathing in for the purposes of obtaining oxygen, but you're mostly bringing in uh, nitrogen. But here's the thing. Plants need nitrogen too, but they can't bring it in, right? They can't like breathe in nitrogen. <clears throat> That's in, right. So even though the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen, that form of nitrogen into that gas is useless to plants, therefore useless to us as well. So we have something called nitrogen fixation. And you need to, well, it's kind of in the name, but you should know that obviously you should associate the nitrogen fixation or the nitrogen cycle but what is nitrogen fixation it's the process that converts the nitrogen gas to something called ammonia um, and then that ammonia gains another hydrogen ion and becomes something called ammonium which is an h4 plus and that is what the plants can use what you don't need to know for the exam is each little step right you don't need to know that first it it goes to ammonia <clears throat> then it becomes ammonium, and the way it does that is by gaining a uh, hydrogen ion. You don't need to know that, right? All you need to know is that nitrogen fixation converts nitrogen gas to a form that the plants can use. I'm not even going to ask that you memorize that it's, you know, NH4 plus is the, the form that plants can use. Just know that there's a process that takes it out of the air and changes it chemically so that plants can use it. That's all you need to know. And then you need to know that that process is called nitrogen fixation. And there's also the opposite of nitrogen fixation, but we'll talk about that here in a second. <clears throat> so are there any questions about this so far? So again, for the exam, the two major pieces of information here are the abiotic reservoirs for nitrogen cycle are atmosphere and soil, and that nitrogen fixation is the process that converts this useless you know, in this context, useless nitrogen gas into a form that plants can use. So most nitrogen comes from biological fixation, like we just talked about, right? Most of the nitrogen in the, the biotic reservoir, that's mo mostly where it came from. It came from nitrogen fixation. It came from things taking that gas and converting it to another form that uh, plants can use. Now, there are two different types that you're not going to be required to know for the exam. The first type lives symbiotic, ah, excuse me, is symbiotically in the roots of plants, and they supply the host with usable nitrogen, and they get nutrients back in um, in exchange. Now, when I say they live symbiotically, I mean that like there's certain species of plants that will always have a certain species of fungus in their in their roots, like in those roots, or the, that fungus that lives in those roots will probably never be found anywhere else. So that's what I mean by symbiotically. Like they literally always exist with each other and don't ever, well, I shouldn't say ever, ever is a strong word, but rarely live without each other. So that's the first type. And the second type is um, we have some free living bacteria that also fix nitrogen, right? Again, we know that it makes NH4 plus, but you don't need to know that for the exam. Again, you don't need to know any of this for the exam, but the point is that um, there's two different types of bacteria that do this job. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Let's move forward. And here's the picture we're talking about. So again, major atmosphere, major abiotic at, ah, reservoir for nitrogen is the atmosphere, right? It's also the soil. And what's happening is, again, we have these different bacteria that are converting this nitrogen gas to a form that plants can use. And then, like I said, there's also something that does the opposite, but I'm not going to ask you any questions about it, but here it is. You have denitrifying bacteria, right? So some bacteria, like we've, the ones we've been talking about, take this gas, this gas nitrogen and convert it to a form that plants can use. And then you have like the opposite right here that turn the useful form, <coughs> excuse me, of nitrogen, and they denitrify it and turn it into gas, and then that's released back into the atmosphere. So again, for the exam, the major things you need to know here are 
the abiotic reservoirs for nitrogen are the atmosphere and the soil and that the process of taking the nitrogen gas and converting it to a form that plants can use is called nitrogen fixation any questions about this slide Okay, let's move forward. Humans have disrupted the nitrogen cycle by adding more nitrogen than the natural processes do, right? And you know this because this is what the first half of the <clears throat> lab video was all about, right? That poisoned waters was all about storm water, or not, excuse, excuse me, not storm water runoff, but uh, nutrient pollution, right? From all those chicken farms and also a little bit of uh, human feces too, but yeah, mostly those chicken farms, right? Because there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, but uh, a lot of nitrogen in that poop. And it used to be absorbed, but there's so much of it now that it's leaching into the um, Chesapeake Bay and it's destroying things, right? And I think what the important thing about this concept is, again, I keep bringing this up in this this last portion of the, the course. Um, sometimes the things that are not necessarily common sense, right? So... For me, like I just told you, nitrogen is good for plants, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus are usually limiting factors. So to me, common sense says, oh, well, there's a bunch of nutrients being leaked into the uh, into the rivers and into the bay. That sounds good, right? Common sense to me would say that's a good thing because the more nutrients you have, the better it is for plants. And the more plants you have, the better it is for the environment, right? So on and so forth. That's what you would think. But again, not everything is common sense. And this is one of those situations, in my opinion, that is not common sense, right? So nitrogen, too much nitrogen going back into the um, environment is a bad thing. Anyway, um, the two major sources of this nitrogen being released back are the combustion of fossil fuels, right? So when I drive my truck to school, as I hopefully will do on Friday, I'm putting out nitrogens. Um, but also, like we just talked about, and with that video agricultural practices as well anyway some nitrogen escapes to the atmosphere and that also forms something called nitrous oxide which also contributes to global warming so again long story short nitrogen going back into the atmosphere and the levels in which it's going right instead of the natural levels the levels that we're doing it it's just not a good thing all that being said i'm not going to ask you any questions about that on the final exam now, are there any questions about this slide? All right. The next word, or excuse me, uh, let's not do the next word yet, but the next bullet point will be about nutrient pollution, which is, again, what you learned about in that first portion of the video. And it's what we just talked about when we talk about phosphorus cycle and nitrogen cycle. So here we are again. Again, the growth of algae is limited by low nutrient levels, specifically the phosphorus and the nitrogen, right? So... Yes, not just algae, but plants, right? All photosynth nearly all photosynthetic organisms are limited by uh, phosphorus and nitrogen. It just so happens in this conversation, we're going to talk about algae inst instead, right? We're going to specifically talk about nitrogen. But again, excuse me, algae. But again, these are, these are limiting factors, phosphorus and nitrogen. Therefore, when we keep putting a bunch of phosphorus and nitrogen into the ecosystems, into the environment, it levels higher than they normally go into it. It's usually a bad thing, right? In this case, we call it pollution, right? Nutrient pollution, specifically. Um, and all, as far as this slide is concerned, uh, when, for the exam, what you need to know here is that nutrient pollution is caused by mostly phosphorus and nitrogen. That's what you need to know for the exam for this slide. And I guess the next word for attendance will be algae. So again, if you're watching live right now, send me those words with it within five minutes of the lecture being over. And if you're watching the video at a later date, um, send me a picture of algae. Here's some more pictures of algae. This is not from your textbook. And you can see how slimy and gross the water looks, right? Because there's just a lot of algae growing in there. Now, let's get a little bit specific, um, even though I'm not going to ask you to specify the differences between phosphorus and nitrogen pollution, we will talk about it very quickly. Um, the phosphate pollution comes from agricultural fertilizers, right? So again, that's in phosphorus and nitrogen are limiting factor in most ecosystems when it comes to uh, when we're talking about the producers. Therefore, humans put it 
onto the plants, right? So if humans are growing plants for their consumption, then they use fertilizer, right? So they'll grow quicker and grow bigger. Um, also, as you know from the video that you watched in lab, runoff of animal waste, right? So livestock feedlots or feedlots, uh, chicken manure, like you learned in the video, right? This is another source of phosphate pollution. And then, of course, again, as we learned about with Blue Plains in the video, sewage treatment plants, right? Um, because again, same kind of same concept here, right? Uh, this bullet point, this middle bullet point, we're talking about um, livestock poop, basically, and then this bullet point, we're talking about human poop, but not just poop either. Uh, the old textbook points out too that you can also get it from dishwasher detergents, in, in addition to human waste. Anyway, again, I'm not going to get this specific on the exam. Just wanted to talk about it very quickly. Um, and then the one last thing to point out is that phosphate pollution in lakes and rivers results in the heavy growth of algae um, and cyanobacteria. And again, you don't need to know that either. But of course, the algae thing, we've been talking about that, right? And that will be, the algae thing will be a little bit more important in one second. And you probably already know where I'm going with this if you remember what you watched in the video. But uh, we'll come back to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So are there any questions about phosphate pollution? All right. Let's see here. Nitrogen pollution is next. And again, I'm not going to ask you to get this specific, but just so you know, the major sources of nitrogen pollution are basically the same stuff. I don't know. This Again, this is from your old textbook. Your book got a little bit specific and was talking about crops and lawns and golf courses. But the same can be said for phosphorus pollution, too, because um, especially when we're talking about um, fertilizers, right, which all three of these things use fertilizers. When humans use fertilizers, they usually it's usually a mix of nitrogen and the phosphorus. So a lot of times these sources uh, for nitrogen and phosphorus are the same. Um, but then your book gets very specific. And again, this could also be this bullet point here could also be applied to phosphorus pollution. But. We have runoff from Midwestern farms that has been linked to annual summer dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, this is just one example. This is from your old textbook. Because again, as you know, we have the same problem with these dead zones, right? We have the same problems in the Chesapeake Bay, for example, because that's what the documentary was about. So what's happening, and this is why, let me back up. This is why I said we've been talking about algae and the algae is going to come back. Well, this is why it comes back. What happens is we have all these nutrients. It's really good for the algae. The algae is blooming, right? It's doing great. But then what happens is the algae dies and there's bacteria that decompose that algae. And the problem is those bacteria use up all the oxygen in the water. And that's where the dead zones come from, right? The dead zones come from those things that are decomposing the dead algae. Um, and in the process of doing that, they are sucking up all the oxygen. So you do need to know what a dead zone is. You don't necessarily need to memorize the fact that there's one in the Gulf of Mexico and that there's one in uh, the Chesapeake Bay or any of the other ones around the world. The idea is you just need to know the dead zones are caused by that excess of algae, algae uh, that die and then get decomposed, and that sucks the basically sucks the oxygen out of the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. So any questions about this? All right. Here's a picture of what we're talking about. This is from your old textbook. Um, but again, this is, you know, basically the Mississippi River and all the tributaries that run into it. So even us, right? You could have, I don't know, maybe you've got like a one acre little uh, plot where you grow things and you use fertilizer and it gets washed down into the stream that's next to your house. And then that washes down to the Canal River, which washes down to the Ohio River, which washes down to the uh, <clears throat> Mississippi River. And then eventually it makes its way out to the Gulf of Mexico, right? So even way up here in West Virginia, we could still be contributing to these dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. And again, the Gulf of Mexico is just one example. We know this, you know, from lab, you know, that also happens in other places like the Chesapeake Bay. But anyway, are there any questions about this slide? Okay. Let's start this last main bullet point, which is good because this would be the last thing we learned for the semester. And we're going to talk about conservation and restoration biology. So basically, we're saying all these things that we just learned, let's talk about how we can actually put that to use. Uh, as your, your books pointed out, 
many environmental problems are caused by humans, right? I would say, well, I don't, I don't want to go out of limb and say most of them, but I guess it depends on how you look at it. If you were looking at it from a economic standpoint or a timeline, whatever the case may be, the point is, <clears throat> again, many environmental problems are caused by humans. Therefore, this ecological research, uh, all this stuff that we learned, it is the foundation for finding the solution to these problems, right? The problems that we have, we can use what we've learned um, in this chapter to find solutions to these problems. We can also use what we've learned to kind of fix the mistakes we've already made, right? We reverse the negative consequences of what we've already done. Of course, you guys might not remember this picture, but this was uh, back when I first started teaching out of this textbook. I think this uh, this water spill had just happened. And Anyway, um, and any questions about this slide before we really jump into it? Okay. So there's basically two things we're going to look at, and we're going to look, and it's conservation biology and restoration ecology. That kind of goes back to these two things we said right here, right? Finding solutions to our problems and also reversing the negative consequences. Well, that's what this is, right? Conservation biology is a goal-oriented science that seeks to understand and counter the loss of biodiversity, right? So basically, again, it's like trying to fix our problems, right? Let's figure out how to do things better, more sustainably. And then the other one, like I said, is restoration ecology. And that uses ecological principles to develop methods of returning degraded areas to their natural state, right? So again, up here we have fixing our problems. Um, and then down here we have uh, cleaning up after ourselves, basically, right? Reversing all the bad things we've done. And again, I use this picture as an example because as you've learned a little bit in this chapter, there's things like secession, right? And there's like native species and non-native species. So here we have this mountaintop removal. And when they're done here, someone's going to use restoration ecology to try to fix this area up. But you have to know what you're doing, right? You can't just throw a bunch of seeds down and be like, all right, well, this will fix itself, right? You need to know all these things that we learned in this chapter. You need to learn about life cycles and ecosystems. And, and again, native versus non-native um, species and primary secession versus secondary secession, all these things to properly restore that area. So any questions so far? All right. Um, the next word for attendance is goal. G-O-A-L. I'm circling it. So again, send me those words within five minutes of the lecture being over. And if you're watching the video later at a later date, um, send me a picture of a goal. And obviously that's a very broad word when you think about it like that. And that's okay. As long as the picture is of a goal, whatever that means to you, then that's okay. All right, let's jump into some concepts that we need to know to discuss conservation and restoration biology. And the first thing we need to talk about is bio biodiversity hotspots. And you do need to know what that is for the exam. Um, and we'll get there, but this is the little introduction. Conservation biologists are applying the understandings of population and community and ecosystem dynamics in establishing parks, wilderness area, and other legally protective nature reserves. So these places, and I chose this one as one example because it's in West Virginia, you know, Cranberry Glades, right? These are places where scientists, you know, different types of uh, ecologists um, have protected an area. Said, all right, this area is not going to be legally protected. And they know what they're doing, right? They've studied all these things and they know what needs to be done to protect it. So again, I'll remind you, not all of this stuff is common sense. Remember when we talked about the invasive cheatgrass, for example, I, and I was even saying, even me, as somebody, as a biologist, if I were to look at it, out at a field of cheatgrass without knowing it, I'd be like, oh, this looks healthy, right? It's a bunch of green stuff and we know plants are good for the environment. But as we learned in that example for uh, invasive species, that in that situation it wasn't good right or the the woodpecker situation right that woodpecker required forest fires it, right it required forest fires to keep the brush down so we could live in those forests and again to me common sense might say well you know this is the habitat of this endangered woodpecker oh my goodness it's on fire let's put the fire out and protect the habitat right that would be common sense but in this case uh, common sense would lead you wrong so again i'm just getting beating this dead horse here. This is why learning these things and studying these things are so important. Even if you're not doing it now, you know, now you know why other people do it because again, to protect areas, 
uh, protect species, things like that. It takes uh, an understanding, right? It's not always common sense. Anyway, back to what's important for the exam. You need to know what a biodiversity hotspot is. That is a relatively small area that has these two things. It has a large number of endangered slash threatened species. And it also has a high, con excuse me, a high concentration of endemic species. And an endemic species is a species that is found nowhere else. Right? So biodiversity hotspot will have one or both of these things. And you need to know that for the exam. That is what a biodiversity hotspot is. For the sake of studying, you might as well just think of them as both, right? Uh, bio, biodiversity hotspots have both of these things. You can just, for the sake of the exam and studying, just memorize that both of those things um, are associated with biodiversity hotspots. <coughs> Excuse me. Are any questions about what a biodiversity hotspot is before I show you some examples of where they are? All right, let's look into it. You do not need to know this for the exam, but all these little purple spots, those are biodiversity hotspots, right? Um, what you can't see is there are actually some biodiversity, some small biodiversity hotspots in our area. They are there, but they're small. Excuse me. But yeah, you can see them all, right? You know, the southwest coast of uh, the United States looks like the entire Central America, uh, the coast, the western coast of South America, so on and so forth. But again, you don't need to memorize any of this. Are there any questions about this slide? Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about is conservation at the ecosystem level. Hopefully we can get through this quickly. Um, that way Friday when we do get together, <clears throat> we'll just be very quickly finishing this chapter. And then that'll give us time for you guys to do the uh, student evaluations. Anyway, here we go. Conservation biology aims at sustaining the biodiversity, basically of everything, right? So, but your book just pointed, or your old book text, ah, excuse me, your old textbook was pointing out that we're looking at sustaining the biodiversity in communities, um, right? And the step above that is an ecosystem, remember? And then here's a new concept for you. A step above an ecosystem is a landscape. And you know what a landscape is. It's an original assemblage of interacting ecosystems such as an area that has a forest and an adjacent field with wetlands in there and a stream and a stream side habitat um those are just examples so from here to here there's nothing to memorize what you need to think of when you think of landscapes and what you need to know for the exam is this right here a landscape is a regional assemblage of interacting ecosystems and again, the really, in my opinion, the best way to think of it is it's a step up from ecosystems. So again, I'll remind you what's not on here is a population, right? A population is a group of one species, right? A group of one species interacting together, uh, dealing with the same uh, situations, right? So I keep using the squirrels on WVSU's campus, right? That is a population. That is one species. They're interacting with each other. They're fight competing for the same resources, right? That's a population. A step up from a population is a community. So now instead of just looking at one population, like one species interacting with each other, we're looking at all the species interacting with themselves and with each other, right? So again, a step up from a population to a community is now we're considering all the living things and how they interact together. And a step up from a community, again, is an ecosystem. And I remind you, an ecosystem is the same as a community. Except now we're not just looking at how the living things interact with each other. We're also looking at how the non-living things affect those living things, right? Like the climate, the soil pH, the, um, the amount of water, whatever it may be, right? So that's an ecosystem. And again, finally, a step up from an ecosystem. Instead of just looking at how all those things interact, we're looking at a landscape, which is looking at how different ecosystems interact with each other. Anyway, are there any questions about what landscapes are before we talk about landscape ecology. All right. That being said, landscape ecology is the application of ecological principles to study land use patterns, right? So again, sort of like the stuff you they briefly talked about in the um, 
the video you watched in lab, right? Uh, so they talked about Tyson's corner and how, you know, you, when we develop a new community, when we develop new areas for humans to live, we need to know what we're doing to, you know, prevent any kind of really bad um, negative, negative consequences. And that's what landscape ecology is all about. The goal is to make <clears throat> conservation a uh, functional part of planning for land use. So again, instead of just being like, well, let's just, uh, let's just bulldoze this portion of the forest and put up a mall, right? It's not that simple. You have to have people who know what they're doing and know how to do it with the, the least amount of harm. That's why permits are required and building permits and things like that. Well, amongst other reasons. But anyway, are there any questions about this slide? Okay. So again, when we're talking about landscapes, we're talking about multiple ecosystems, right? Neighboring ecosystems that are interacting with each other. Um, and the edges between ecosystems is a prominent feature of landscapes whether it's a natural landscape or if it's a human landscape. And I'll give you a, a picture of both coming up so you can see a good example. Um, and in that picture of both, we are going to be able to see edges. We're going to see this, um, the border between two different ecosystems. And those that border between two ecosystems, they have their own physical conditions, right? So not only are you looking at two different ecosystems, and then again, when you look at the border, in a sense, you're almost looking at a third. So here's an example, right? So we have edges created by humans on the right. We have natural edges on the left. But look at all these different ecosystems, right? So you have, it's a little bit hard to see here, but this is looks like an ocean, right? So that's an aquatic ecosystem. And then that meets this, you know, this forest ecosystem. But you can see in between those is an edge, right? And that happens to be a beach. Right, so that beach, that border between the the sea and the forest, that beach is going to be its own unique ecosystem. Likewise, right again, here we have the forest, and over here we have this field of green. Those are two different types of ecosystems, right, with different living things, different species, different populations. Uh, but right here is the edge of the two, and as you might imagine, things that are growing there are different than what's growing deeper inside those woods or in this. Uh, in this meadow, this field of greens. Same thing, one last example. Again, we have this field, right? This field looks like grass. And then right here we have a river, right? Those are, or a stream, whatever. Those are two completely different ecosystems. And then also right here on the edge, right? That the bank of that river is going to be a different situation than the, uh, the grass or the river itself, right? Anyway, so those are just examples. There's nothing to memorize here. The point is, the, both of these pictures are great examples of landscapes because we have all these different types of ecosystems. Again, forest ecosystem here, uh, grassland ecosystem here, urban ecosystem here, you know, um, and they all come together and they all interact with each other. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. An important feature in these things, right? Well, again, we're talking about these different types of ecosystems because we're talking about landscapes. So these all these ecosystems that are interacting with each other. And we have something called a movement corridor. And you need to know what that is. It is a narrow strip or a series of small clumps of habitat that connect otherwise isolated patches, which as a human might not make much sense because a human would just think, all right, well, I can just walk from here to here. Or if I need to, I can swim from here to here or you know, paddle a boat from here to here whatever the case may be. But not all species can just move willy-nilly, right? Sometimes they need some help, and that's what a movement corridor is. It can promote dispersal, which is good, right? It can be good is when you want to get, you know, species to disperse, you know, and go out and go to other areas and help biodiversity. Um, it can also help sustain populations, which is a good thing. Um, and obviously, for when there's species that migrate between different habitats, that's going to be even more important for them because it's in them like they have to migrate, right? So some species can just stay where they are. Other species have to migrate. And obviously, if they have to migrate, then a movement corridor would be uh, very good. Um, then, of course, there are some bad things, right? So they can also spread disease. Um, they could also spread, you know, invasive species, so on and so forth. But you don't need to know all those details. What you need to know is this right here. A movement corridor is a narrow strip or series of small clumps of habitat that connect otherwise isolated patches. And the last word for, for uh, attendance will be patches. <laughs>
So send me those words if you're online. You've got five minutes to do that. If you're watching the video at a later date, send me a picture of the word patches along with the other stuff. Does anybody have any questions about anything? All right, then I will see you all on Friday. Mr. D, yeah. just to clarify for myself, um, um, so what we've gone over for this chapter is all we're doing for the exam, right? It's not cumulative? No, the exam is half cumulative and half new stuff. Okay. So, and I'm glad you asked because it's a good time for me to remind everybody. You know, there's about oh, there's going to be about 100 questions on the final. About 50 of those questions are going to come verbatim from your first three exams, which is why I keep telling everybody, hey, you should probably meet with me so I can give you all the correct answers to the old exams. One, because you need to study those for the final, and two, because you'll get a 5% boost to whatever grade it is for whichever uh, exam you meet me for. Some of you have already done that. But yeah, I've been saying that all semester, and this is why, because now you're going to have to learn, you know, study those first three exams will be, you know, again, half of what the uh, final exam is. Um, and the other half, the other about 50 questions are going to come from um, chapters, you know, the, the basically the PowerPoints, right? So chapters 19, 13, and 20. And yes, there are portions from chapter 21 that are going to be on there, but those are already, even though we didn't officially cover chapter 21 the important stuff that you need to know from chapter 21 was incorporated into the chapter 20 uh powerpoint so great question any other questions all right in that case i'm going to stop recording i'm going to step away for about 10 minutes and then i'll be back on for uh office hours at nine